is this? Uh, we'll see if anybody else joins. Maria might join. Who knows? So I hope everybody is is uh, having a good week and has been able to work hard. Uh, we've got a couple of good things li lined up for us today. Colin is going to finish out iterations, which is excellent. Um, and then Sandra is going to spend a little bit of time on what comes next. So model, model building or whatever it is. I haven't looked that closely at that chapter. Um, but it would re depending on how much time we have left, um, I have also worked a little bit in her trying to understand her more. And I have always had like, I didn't even know what questions to ask about it. And finally, I think I know what questions to ask. And so if we have some time towards the end, um, I'll, I'll ask those questions and share my screen and stuff and we can, we can walk through, through how that went. But um, let me see if I can think of anything else. Any other announcements or things to think about? I don't, I don't think so. Um, so I guess we'll just go off with then uh, over to you, Colin. Sweet. Uh, so we've already been kind of talking about it. Um, I was going to do a quick five minute icebreaker here. Let's see. So I'll share my screen. Everybody can see my slides, right? Okay, good. Uh, so we're in week 25. We're going to finish iteration like Ryan said, and then we'll jump over to 22 and 23. Um, just kind of the five minute icebreaker. We already kind of talked about it, but, uh, the icebreaker that I have for tonight was what's something good that happened to you this week. So any good news doesn't have to be R related or data analysis related. It could be anything. My, my wife was on vacation. She went and met up with some of her family out in California. The good part is that she came back. And it was like right at the time that I needed her to come back. So <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> I only had like four days in me of doing it by myself. And she finally came back right in time. <laughs> um, That's good. Something good happened uh, this week. Uh, this weekend, we have a family uh, we joined together and uh, we had a barbecue. We we use something new like uh, not not American style barbecue but uh, no some kind of Asian style, and we this is the first time we try it and it we didn't I didn't expect it to be good but it turned out to be really good so we everyone was happy. That's great! It's great that you guys spent some time with your family too as well. Yeah. Monza, Sandra. Mm, I I would say that. It's always good. It's always good. Sorry, you cut out there a little bit. Did you say your kids went back to school? I think Sandra might be frozen. Okay. <laughs> I can't remember it's always me or, or, or anything. So, um, oh, and my daughter got her license. Oh, great. That's good. That's also That's a good thing, too. Uh, Mansa, what about you? Um, I tried making tres leches cake, and it turned out to be okay. So <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations on an open cake. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Great. Uh, well, I'm glad everyone's having a good week. Um, so just let's jump in tonight. Uh, we're just going to kind of well, here's some quick housekeeping things. Like I said, we've all been around here for several weeks, so I don't need to remind everybody of any of these. The most important one that I think is, uh, you know, if you have any questions, make sure you ask them. Uh, don't be afraid to stop me or to correct me in any way. Uh, you know, if you have a question, most likely someone else has that question. So I just want to reiterate that to make sure that it is okay to stop me if you have a question or want to discuss something further. But the rest of these, you, we, we pretty much know these. We're in week 25, so I shouldn't need to keep covering them. So tonight what we're going to do is we're going to finish chapter 21. We're going to talk about, I think we'll quickly review mapping over multiple arguments uh, using uh, map2 and, and pmap. I'm going to quickly review those. I felt last time I was kind of breezing through those, and I felt that I could have maybe done a little bit better of a job kind of covering what I was trying to discuss. 
So I'll kind of review those really quick. Then we'll talk about per walk. Then we'll discuss some other patterns of for loops, specifically talking about predicate functions and um, talking about, uh, uh, I think it's aggregating and the other one, the other function that was available. But we'll talk about some other patterns for for loops. I'll probably take about 15, 20 minutes and then we'll jump over to Sandra. We'll jump over to chapters 22 and 23 and we'll start talking about modeling. So to kind of get us back up to speed where we left off, we were talking about per map functions and we were kind of going through some of the examples and looking at the advantages of, of, of map. But one issue that we ran into was this concept of, well, what if we have multiple inputs? What if we have more than one input that we want to provide to a function so that we can use that to iterate over multiple objects? And we talked about that per provides two different functions for us. We talked about map two, which allows us to input two inputs into it. And then we talked about P map, which takes an infinite amount of inputs. Um, so we talked about why there isn't like a map three or a map four or map five or map six, mainly because that would just become redundant and it would never end. And so the per package decided to just use a P map which allows you to specify as many inputs as you want. So we were kind of discussing some of these and I was kind of sharing an example with you in regards to creating multiple or creating multiple um, ggplot outputs. And so one thing that we were looking at was we were looking at this first one of just say we want to map over the empty cars columns and output some type of scatter plot. But what we're interested in doing is outputting many different scatter plots, looking at the relationship between the variables in MT cars on MPG, miles per gallon. And so when we ran this, we would see that we would get all the different variables plotted out on a scatter plot using ggplot. And so you can kind of go through and you can look at all of these. These are all the scatter plots for um, all the different variables on MPG. But we said there was a problem with this one in that the X axis is not labeled on any of these. All of them are just dot X. And so what we were saying is, well, what if we could provide another input into our map functions <clears throat> to have these be labeled? And so then that's where the map two function comes in. And so to get or to plot or to change the title of the X axis here, what we needed to do is we needed to create a separate vector of names, empty cars. So if I just run this and look at names, now I have a vector of all the names. Now I have two inputs. I have the empty cars data set, and now I have the names vector right here. And I have the function defined right here within the map function. So with map two, what we have is two, Two, essentially two placeholders, dot X and dot Y. Dot X is the placeholder for the objects coming from empty cars. And then dot Y is the placeholder that is taking in the objects for names. And so if I run this, because of our two inputs, it's gonna run those inputs in parallel. Now each one of these is gonna have the X axis labeled. So here's displacement, here's DRAT. I'm not sure what that one is, weight, uh, quarter seconds, uh, so on and so forth. And so map two provides us that ability to have two inputs is basically what that is. <clears throat> now we said, well, what if we want to add more to this? What if we wanted to add such things as uh, plotting a third variable? So plotting the size of the points based on some variable. What if we wanted to add a custom title? Well, essentially there, now we have three inputs. And because uh, map, our map functions want to include many different inputs. We have to use PMAP in this case. So PMAP is a little bit different. So what we have to do for PMAP is we have to essentially create a list of all of our vectors or all of our inputs. In our case, we want to plot the X variable. We want to change the size of the points, which I call the bubble. And then we want a custom title. And then these are going to basically be the three inputs for it. Then we have to define the function 
that we want these inputs are that we we have to find the function that uses these inputs and in our function the arguments are our input items so here because we're plotting the x-axis and we want to plot all the variables in empty cars we're going to plot x bar right here then if we want the bubble bar which is going to be the size of the point we have it specified for size here and then for the title we have our title that gets introduced into that labs or, or that labs function there for ggplot. And so basically what it's going to do is it's going to take these R, this args list and it's going to run these in parallel as it performs that specific function. Now the flexibility of the PMAP is we could have four inputs, five inputs, six inputs, as many inputs as you want, but you have to kind of follow this basic structure. What's also nice about this and something that I wasn't completely comfortable with when I read the chapter was that instead of just doing a list of objects, you could do a list of functions if you wanted to. And so I, I kind of understood the basic concept, but I couldn't really think of an example of how to do it because I haven't ever used it. But you could think about that you could change these inputs into a function and then just provide or different functions here and then provide different inputs. And so it was a little murky for me in the book, but I, I kind of understood it. But you don't just have to have inputs or you don't have to have just inputs like vectors or tibbles or lists to use PMAP. So that's pretty much uh, mapping over multiple inputs. Does anybody have any questions on the use of map to PMAP or did I miss anything that I should have covered? Um, I'm just going to open up the floor for any any input from anybody. Ryan, is that the best time for you to ask your questions that we are talking about pure? Say what? I certainly can. Um, I don't want to take away any time from you. Um, no, but it's just that uh, it's connected to, uh, okay. to pure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to. I'm happy to go through mine. It might take a little while. Um, so um, anyway, I can, I can go through all my stuff once Colin's done, but if you, um, anyway, I don't want to, I don't want to imprint and um, move in on your time is all. So. Okay. Um, and actually, Colin, what is neat is you didn't talk about it's a set name because the set name, yeah, after you could name all your list here, you know, it, because even if they're plot, they, are, they have name. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I forgot to tell you about set names. So set names basically is, is the way I understand it is, is that you can supply it with a vector or an object that contains the different names to it. So when it gets outputted, those objects are named in the outputted list. So if I run this, then I run the PMAP, and then I run the empty cars, and actually I do need to run these because one of my examples use this as again, you can see all of the objects are now the custom titles. So if I look at this right here, you can see its relationship between MPG and cylinder. And if you just look at this object title subsetting or the subsetting the titles out of the args to object, you can see its relationship between MPG and MPG, so on and so forth from there. And so you can use the set names. If I didn't supply this, you would just get the numbers or you would just get like an index. So then it'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so if you wanted to subset an object outside of it, you would have to use the index number rather than a named item. Is that clear? Okay. Um, and the object that you put into set names needs to be the same, I think. Uh, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm not sure. Someone might want to double check me on this. But I think this has to be the same length as the output. But what, what I'm not confident is if, if the recycling rules apply to this or not. I don't think it does. I think it has to be the same length. But someone might want to double check me on that one. Um, so the next ones are pretty kind of pretty easy to kind of wrap your mind around. Um, the, the book kind of talks about the walk function as an alternative to map. Walk is important when we want to capture the side effects for the function, not necessarily the output or the return value. And so the example, the two different use cases that the book talked about was when we want to render output to the screen or we want to save files to disk. 
So the book has this uh, quote in it, and I thought it was kind of important. But the important thing when you're using walk is the action, not necessarily the return value. And so it, it, let me just show you the example here that I have. But say I wanted to save all of these plots to my computer. Well, that's a side effect. Writing to disk is a side effect. I'm not outputting the plots to R. I'm, I'm trying to capture the side effect of just putting it on disk. I don't care about creating the plots so I can use them later. So that's where we can use walk or pwalk. And so what I'm basically doing here is I'm first specifying the paths. So all this function on line 296 does is it just gives me a bunch of string values to name our plots. And that is not correct because I think I need to, uh, I forgot to do something up here, do this. Uh, it's because you run without the name. So. Yep, because I ran without the names. And so if I run it now, it should be good. <laughs> Hopefully I don't have to off road here. So now I have the list of the names. I'm gonna save it as a ping file, a .png. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pass a list object with the paths and my plots. I'm gonna run the ggsave function and ggsave has an argument in it called path. And so it's just basically gonna write all of these ping files into my plots folder. And I'll show you that here in a second. But if I run this, all pwalk is doing is it's just trying to capture that side effect of write it to the disk. So nothing gets outputted from pwalk that I can use in my R environment. But if I go over to my file structure or my file system over here, and I look at my plots folder, now I have all of the plots that got outputted to my specific, uh, to my specific file folders that I wanted to put them in. So if I go through, now I have all these ping files that I can use, which is kind of nice. So again, walk is really good if you want to use them for like trying to capture side effects is kind of the best thing. The two cases that are most common are you're trying to render stuff to the, the screen or you're trying to save stuff to disk that you want to save for later. Uh, let's see here. So the Actually, book you, oh, go ahead. You, you, you show us something I've never seen. I've never seen how you use an argument in a pure. I saw that it wasn't possible to do that, something like that, the way you use pass. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I actually never used to use that. But like, because pwalk has the dot, dot, dot in it. Okay. It's a dot, dot. Okay. So like, if you look at the, if you look at the, um, if you look at the, the documentation of it, all the map functions have the dot, dot, dot. So if you pass the dot F into it, it should take an argument. So if one of your functions has an argument in it, the dot, dot, dot will allow you that flexibility to define it. Which is kind of interesting to me because somebody brought this up. So somebody brought this up as a question. I don't know if I saw it on Twitter, if I saw it on, on the Slack, but somebody asked why why these dot f's, dot y's, dot x, or dot data. And some, I think it was, I think it was actually, uh, his name's John. He's kind of one of the mentors. He, I think he brought up the idea that the reason why we have dots is because they're trying to avoid conflicts with stuff that we have or different arguments and functions that you pass through. So the dots are trying to get away from, the dots in front of like the dot f or the dot data is trying to get away from other arguments that you could put possibly pass into through the dot, dot, dot. Did that make sense? Is that clear? But I thought that was kind of interesting because I've always asked that question of like, why do we have all this dot x, dot data, dot this? It's mainly because the tidyverse, people who develop the tidyverse packages are trying to stay away from other argument names or conflicts with those. So I thought that was kind of neat and kind of interesting to see like the forethought that went with that, so. Good question though. Uh, yeah, but I've never started doing that. I never really understood the dot, dot, dot until I read like, I think functions chapter. Then I was like, this is, these are really, really cool. I'm glad that these are available. Um, cool. Any other questions about walk? Okay, cool. Uh, so there's some other patterns for for loops that are available. And so I'm just going to kind of quickly go through these. And I thought they were, they were kind of neat. And actually I, use one of these functions. I was glad that I read about this function because I used it actually this week. 
but the book kind of talks about some different functions that you can use. Um, instead of me kind of reading through these to save time, I'm just going to jump into the examples, but you can kind of read these. These are kind of the definitions from the book, but really all these functions do is they return elements based on some conditional that you specify. But what's important to remember is, is that they return values based on a single true or false. And so what was nice about this, and I'll share a couple of use cases that I thought was kind of interesting, but what you can do, the function keep and discard, you can provide a, a, a function in here that evaluates to either true or false and return those values that are true. So in our case, an empty cars, and we can look at it, if we pass empty cars into it, it's going to take every single column of empty cars and then using this function max of every column of dot x, any column that has a value that is greater than 50 will be returned. Another way to think about this is just, just take keep and place map with it and then think of it as like it's a filter almost. It's kind of like a filter using this function is the way I thought of it. So if I ran this, I should only get two columns returned because there's only two columns that have a max value above 50. Now, discard is just the opposite of this. It's the same thing. It's just going to discard any column that uh, evaluates to true based on this conditional that we provide. In our case, we're saying um, discard any columns that have a value greater that have a maximum value greater than 50. You might not see it, but you can you'll know that two columns are gone because empty cars has 11 columns. Now we get nine, excuse me, nine columns returned. Okay. Any questions about keep or discard? I was sitting there. I, I remember reading the chapter. I remember saying to myself, I don't know if I'll ever use this. Well, that was actually a lie to myself because I found a situation where I could use it this week. Um, I found myself in a situation where I was doing some map functions that would return an empty tibble. Now, the problem was is that after I got this, the, this list of tibbles returned, my process sometimes returned an empty tibble. And in that case, what happened is, is I was going to do some, I was going to do some like calculations beyond with all those tibbles that I returned, but I was getting an error because I had an empty tibble. So what you could use as a use case for discard or keep is in cases where you don't have an, where you get a, like an empty tibble returned. So in this case right here, if I look at this object empty tibble, you can see I have data here, I have the empty tibble, and then I have data here. If I run this, if I run this mean function, yeah, it's going to return an NA, but it's also going to return a warning to me saying, hey, there's something that's not numeric, so I'm just going to return NA. Well, what I could have done is I could have used discard up here first, write some type of conditional, in my case, I'm saying n rows uh, equal to zero. Discard that. Empty tibble doesn't have any rows. So if I run this, now I don't get that warning message. And I only get the values returned for the two uh, tables that have um, the x column in it. Okay. So I actually use this. I was like, wow, this is great. At first, I was like, I don't know if I'm ever going to use this. And then Lo and behold, when I say it, I was like, oh, this is a case that I can use this. So um, any questions about the use of discard or keep? So the last couple ones that were available, and I'll run through these kind of quickly, but the use of some and every, these are just kind of tests that you can use basically to say, um, are any of the input values that I provided are they character or are they vector or whatever they may be? And so in our case right here, it's just basically iterating through these three objects, the vector of one through five, the vectors of letters, and then the list of a value 10. Basically what we're doing is it's saying, is any of these a character? Well, it's true because letters is a character. Now every is more strict. It's gonna say, do all of these elements meet my test. In our case, I'm saying is vector. If 
I run this, it's going to be true because every one of these is a vector. But if I pass in is character here, this should be false because not every single one of them is false or not every single, every single one of them is not a character. So I thought about this like really quick. These could be like quick tests that you could use for. So like if you have uh, a data set where you need to make sure every single column is numeric. Well, in empty cars, we can do that test really quick with some, right? We can say, okay, are some of these numeric? Yeah. Well, if we want to be more strict and say, okay, are all columns numeric? Then we can use this for every. And so I was sitting there thinking, okay, well, where could I use this? Well, this could be a, uh, one thing is, is if you're running like a correlation. Correlation requires you to have all numeric data. And so one thing that you could do really, really quick is kind of create this simple test to say, okay, are all my columns numeric before I pass it into my um, correlation analysis? Well, you could use every to make sure that that test is being met before you pass it on into your correlation function. Just another example, flights, same thing. Some is numeric. Yeah, there are some numeric columns in flights. If we want the more strict test, this will return false because some of the columns in the flights data are not numeric. And so it's going to return false. Okay. Um, the last kind of couple ones that were out there were detect and detect index. Same thing. It's just taking a conditional test. And then detect is just looking for the actual value. So if I run this here, I get my X object, 3948. I'm looking to return all values that are greater than five. Run it. Um, nine. Uh, I don't know if that's right. I think I might be mistaking what detect does. Detect index will tell you which where in the index it's greater than five. But I think detect is only telling me where it first goes over five. Is that correct? I might be mistaken. Somebody might have to correct me on this one. Yeah, that's correct. The first element when when it's true. Oh, okay. Yeah, because nine is the first. So it's going to iterate through this, this vector, right? So it's going to iterate through X, three, nine, four, eight, seven. It's only going to return the first one that's going to come return back, which is nine. If you wanted to look through all of, well, if you wanted to use a conditional to go through each one going from the first element forward or the last element backwards, you would use head while or tail while. Same thing, same test. X, X, X. Head while greater than five. Tail while nine, six, seven. So you could do that as well. Um, so the book also talks about reduce and accumulate. Um, I thought this one was kind of interesting, the one with reduce. So say you have a bunch of list elements. So here we have a bunch of tibbles. And say we want to do a full join with all of these data sets. Well, what we can do is we can just use reduce and use this function full join to perform a full join on all these data objects. So I thought this was kind of interesting. I, I was trying to find a case where I could use this, but... Uh, I don't do a lot of work that requires full joins of like three or more tables, but in your work, you might run across that where you could just perform a full join on many different tables all in one. Accumulate, uh, again, you're just passing in a function. Um, so we have a sample of 10 numbers. We're going to run this function called accumulate. And how do we want to accumulate them? We just want to add them up. And so we just add the plus in this, in this case. And so now what we're getting is like a cumulative sum. So we get 2, 12, 20, 23. And so it's just basically adding up the vector and it's keeping on growing and growing and growing. So that was pretty much chapter 21, iteration. So um, any questions, discussion? I've got two. So can you go back to your code that you had in R? Sure. So um, on line 367, you have just a dot instead of dot x. Why would it only take a dot instead of a dot x? I think, just hold on, let me just look at detect here real quick. 
So I think it's just shorthand. Okay. I think it's just taking a dot. I think it's just shorthand. It still takes dot X. So I think it's just shorthand. I think that I think this is, uh, I shouldn't say that. I was, I was thinking that this might be a case of lazy evaluation, but I don't, now that I'm just thinking that, I don't think that's true. But um, I think it's just shorthand. The book talked about it for being dot, but when I'm looking at the, like the function definitions, it has dot X, dot F, and so on and so forth. My other question, can you go up a few rows where you were, were um, I think we're getting close here. Um, so yeah, let's do this one right here. Or 300, like row, these predicate function examples. Okay. So um, actually go up one more. I want to see if there's a simpler. No, okay. So under there, under the predicate function examples. All right. So what this is doing is taking the MT cars and it's keeping all of the columns where the maximum value in the column is greater than 50. Yeah. Yep. And so the, the displacement and the HP are the only two where the maximum. Okay, good. All right. So now can you go to MT cars and do a split after that and split it by cylinders or whatever? Because empty cars is one data frame by itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so now if you do split by cylinder, you're going to end up with like, like three data frames in a list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So three data frames based off of the cylinder size. Mm -hmm. And now when you do keep max dot X greater than 50, what is this trying to do? Because it's uh, it's gone from before it was a data frame and then in map it was looking at each column of the data frame mm -hmm. this is now a list that needs to look at each data frame but then within each data frame it needs to look at each column yes so because what you're passing into here now it's no longer because the, the way i look at it is before if you took this out it's iterating over the columns, right? right? Right. But now you change the output because split outputs a list of objects. Right. So now keep won't work because you're not you're not using this conditional to test each column. You're using this conditional to test each list object. But each data frame, data frame, which doesn't really make sense as a max dot x, mm -hmm. right? So I'm trying to think of a way that you could do this. I wonder if there's an I key. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's not necessary to figure out how to do it. I, my question was mostly centered around the, this, this uh, hierarchy. Mm. Um, and my question, I guess, was really like, did we actually break, um, like, keep max X by splitting it into three data frames and now that no longer works for keep max dot x. And it sounds like it does. That, that's what happens. Keep max dot x only works if you're passing a single data frame because it's going to iterate over those columns. Yep. Because you yeah. got to think about what's your input, what's your output. Our output in this case is a list of data frames. And so I'm trying to figure out what, how to, how to change this conditional to test each one, right? So like what you could do, uh, well, uh, oh, you know what you could do? I don't know. I'm off-roading right now, so I could be. Yeah, no, I, I, it's cool. I think this is, this is what you have to do. Yeah, you have to put a map inside of this. And so, well, wait, so keep map. You'd have to do the map first. Maybe. Yeah. So map. Well, no, because we want to. Well, yeah. So map do keep dot x greater than 50. No, I, I see what you're trying to do. I just can't think of it right now. And I don't want to like go off roading yeah. and figure it out. But I, I think I can figure this out. Yeah. But it's something where you would have to like it's it's changing the input and the output is the issue. Yeah but you can nest these items to do what you want to do. 
Because basically what you want to do is you want to look at, you want to see if you can eliminate columns based on this conditional for each data frame that's split by cylinder. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was more an exercise in seeing like if we add in a level upstream, does it break everything downstream? And, and it looks like it does. So you have to accommodate that somehow. Yep. Comes back down to input output, but yeah. that's a good question. But yeah, you can, it's flexible enough to do it. I just, I can't off road that yeah. I'm not that good right now. <laughs> no, that's, that's what's kind of been beating me down on, on per a little bit is trying to understand this, the different levels and the inputs and the different levels of the outputs. So. Yeah. I think you just need to kind of remember what's the input, what's the output, you know, that's kind of the big thing. Okay. Good question. Any other questions? So I was going to suggest maybe um, I was going to show what I was working on with her trying to get my head around it all. And Sandra, if we go all the way to the time, are you okay to just maybe do yours next week? Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. Um, maybe I can do the introduction because you know the introduction is still short. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And let me stop sharing. And you can you can share. So how much time should I save you, Sandra? Mm, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. That, that means I've got about 10 minutes to show. Okay. I can stay after too if you want me to help you with some other stuff too. I don't have anything after this. All right. Let's see. So I'm going to share screen number three. All right. So this was, this was a conversation that I had with myself as I was going through um, as I was going through, just exploring around with Per, um, and so I'll read you the comments and I'll read you the code and we'll just look through it or whatever, right? Okay. So first, a little bit tidy verse, which I think I already did. Okay, good. So in this exercise, I just want to take the square root of sepal length column of the iris data set. Okay. So hopefully everybody is a little bit familiar with the iris data set. It's a pretty simple one. It has these four these four numerical columns, sepal length, sepal width, pedal length, pedal width, but then it has a, a character, a factor column of species, okay? Pretty straightforward, right? Uh, and what I'm trying to do is take the square root of each of these items, 5.1, 4.9, and so on down, okay? All right. That's the whole thing, so partially good. All right, so this was just what I thought might do it. Um, Iris piped that into the map. The column that I wanted to iterate over each element of sepal length, I wanted to take the square root. So I didn't, okay, I didn't get why, you need, why we need map. Uh, I, I didn't get, okay, I know the iris, so I don't get why mutate shouldn't find the way directly. Why mutate what? What mm -hmm. mutate? Um, if, uh, have you tried if you could just mutate? Right. No, I, I probably could just mutate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just mutate that column and square. Uh, yeah. Is this, yeah. I, I probably could, but. This was, this was how I was doing it, trying to understand okay. map a little bit better, okay? So, so I, I ran this and I get an error. Error in as mapper.f object sepal length not found. So my idea that piping in this data frame of iris into the map function, I and mean, it doesn't even find the sepal length column. The, the data frame, piping the data frame into map doesn't even find that column. Yeah, but, but I, my understanding is that when you do iris the pipe, it means that now it's like all the list of colon of iris are the argument of your map function. So what is, so sepal length has no sense because it's like we saw with Colin, it's we have the colon. Um, I, I think I think I understand. Was, uh, okay. So if you oh, go ahead, it, yeah. So if so if you understand, explain because I'm not good in English. 
that's not true. <laughs> no, no, that's not. No, that's not true. This is. I, I, I think. I, I think I know what you're saying, Sandra. It's because I think because like try quotations around it because what you're doing here is your sepal dot length. This is what I'm thinking. I don't know if it's true or not, but is this what you're thinking of, Sandra? Because no, what I'm thinking is that if we leverage what you just show us, if we do iris, if we after we take only the numeric one, then after we do map and we don't put anything and we, and we put SQRT, then we could get the SQRT of all the colon. Sepal length has no sense because we have iris and the pipe. It means that now we have a list of colon of iris. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if we, uh, if you remove, maybe remove, remove sepal length. Uh, do what with sepal length? Can you remove it? Remove it? Yes, remove it. Okay. Okay, and now if we run the issue, okay, maybe we have a character. Okay, it's because we have a character. Right. It's oh. Because we have a character. So if we keep Iris only the col or maybe if we keep only the first five uh, colon, which only numeric, after it will work, but we don't need sepal length. Right. Okay. This one should work. Okay. Yeah. So so that one does work because I've I've passed just the, the single column. Oh, I didn't read. Okay. Into into map and here's the function. Mm -hmm. What happened when 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 you put the sepal length in quotes? Um, I got a bunch of null. Um, actually, let me see if it shows up in the R markdown. Yeah. Sepal length null, sepal width null, pedal, everything's null. Mm, okay. So in my mind, I'm missing something with the idea of passing this entire data frame into the map function. And I thought that it would go through each column, but... It just, okay, it's just because, you know, I explained the pipe and it's the reason I know. It's because the pipe, it means that here is the pipe mean exactly list of colon of iris. The list of columns. Colon of iris. So after, it will mean that if we try to rewrite without the pipe, it will mean that we have, uh, f so f if we take the second one, the iris one, so yeah. it means that now it will be exactly like map iris one SQRT. Yeah. Um, map. So it means that it doesn't have sense. We have you have two arguments, but you also have the list of iris to pass in the pipe. Okay. So I yeah. So I get that it passes just the the single column into map, and and on this one it passes the first two columns. So I do get I get I get two lists, mm -hmm. right? as we'd expect. So I, I, I get that, I mean, I get the idea here that I can specify the columns that I wanna pass in. Um, I just had thought that just by passing in the whole entire data frame that it would work too, but, but maybe, I don't know, maybe I just have like bad syntax or something on this one. Because when I get down to, to this one where I do iris and map and square root. So, so the, the whole data frame is passed in and this is the function. Then I get this, this error message. Square root is not meaningful for factors, which makes sense because this is talking about the species column and that's, you can't take a square root of that. So I get that. So then I think, well, let me just make a, a data frame just of the four numerical columns, okay? No problem. And then I pass this whole entire data frame into map and it works. One, two, three, four. Oops. So let me go back to where that was. Um, so this, so this line right here did work. I have 
a whole data frame, just like I was trying to do before when I was trying to pass in Iris, the whole data frame. Here I am passing again of the whole entire data frame and I specify the function and it all works. Okay, so great. I high five myself because I finally got it to work, but I'm not sure I entirely understand, um, I guess the kind of the syntax of this because I don't have the tilde, I don't have a dot X, I don't have a dot F equals. So um, anyway. Um, well, is this where you could use the keep function? Like you could do a quick test <clears throat> what you can do is you can you go back up to your, your initial where you first started. Mm -hmm. So go all the way back up to the top. So in between Iris and your map, do a keep. So K-E-E-P, close the function, close and open the function. And then use the function is that numeric. Is that numeric? Then pipe that. Uh, I'll take away those close and open parentheses. Uh, so close that. And then pipe it into map. And then take away sepal length and then run that one and see if it does what you were looking initially to do. That looks like it. So that's four. Oh, did you mean like one? Yeah, I mean, it's the whole data frame, but mm -hmm. it, it, it worked. It, I get the idea of it. So. Does it have anything to do with the, with the map function taking vectors only and not list? That's what the book says, but I don't know if that's the reason. I don't know. I'm, I'm mostly trying to, to understand the syntax of it all. So. Honestly, Ryan, I never use the pipe when I use map because I find it too confusing. I prefer to write full, uh, the, full uh, the, the full code. Uh, yes, I avoid the pipe because after you don't know exactly what you put inside. Yeah. So maybe if you just uh, rewrite without the pipe, it will be less confusing. So that would be map, iris. The, the F, because you have the, new, is, the issue with the non the factor. If you remove, okay. Um, yeah, this is going to error out, right? This one, yeah, this one won't work, but. So map, iris, the first four columns, and then it does. I find it easier to understand. Okay. So why do I not need this in this case, the tilde? I, when I do that, now I get function x primitive quote square root. I have no idea. What that is. Maybe because it's a special function, you know, maybe, you know, SQRT, it's such non-function, so maybe it has some special role, maybe it's... I, I think it may be because the SQRT, the square, square root is, all, is already a function in R. And okay. then the, and the when you, you only use the delta when you are talking about an expression. Okay. Yeah, something that is not already a function, that's something that is not already a function, but you want to loop it Okay, that makes sense. So if I make a new function here, and I'm going to call it square root mm -hmm. function, um, what would it be? Like number? Number input. And then it's going to be number input. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Oh, but uh, the, you need to close. But you, in this case, the square root. So you are gonna pass the, this function to, to to inside your map. In this case, you still don't need the delta because square root is something you already defined. Okay. It is an expression. Is it not? Okay. For example, like x plus two, <laughs> like. Okay. So, so if I, only if I was going to define the function right here. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. That, that's, that's all. Right. Mm -hmm. I think so. 
Oh, please write. <laughs> like this? Well, now you shouldn't need that. Now you shouldn't need the the tilde on this one, because because the tilde is just shorthand. It's shorthand to say define function. Yeah. Okay. So when do you include the tilde and when do you not include? The um. <laughs> Uh, so right, see right here, you are defining the function here. You're, you're defining an anonymous function. So in this case, you don't need the tilde. The tilde is only there if you want to use it as shorthand. So this, uh, this should work. Yeah. You walk, you walk. Okay. Yeah, it works <laughs> because you gotta remember the tilde is just shorthand. It's just shorthand for function. Okay. So when, so how do I, how do I alter this line? in order to use the tilde uh take away well take away uh, and take can away. you try to this square root yeah i'm still just doing a square root but yeah. so take away all of this yeah, yeah take take away all that and then yeah. tilde square root square root sqrt dot x sqrt right yep and then open and close it and then do dot x. Okay. And then it should work now. But okay, so but this is making reference to the square root function that already exists. Mm -hmm. So this, if I take this away, if I take the tilde away. And do function, but then you would have to define, you'd have like the tilde is just like shorthand for function dot yeah. x. So you could put function dot x in there. So before you could do, you know, well, that works too, because you don't, because it's automatically passing in square root. But that there, I think it's using the dot, 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 I think, but yeah, I- A little confusing. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe. Well, my, my time's up. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we made, it through the, <laughs> we made it through the first line. Uh, anyway. I, 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 I'm, this is why I have a hard time trying to figure out what it is. Like, when do you use the tilde? When do you not use the tilde? When do you define a function? What if it's an already defined function like square root? Um, anyway, I'll keep playing around with it. All right, Sandra. Okay. I only let so, you do uh, this, but I will share. Take, take a couple extra if you need it. Okay. Uh, I think it's this one. Okay. Do you see? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So uh, it's a chapter 22. So it's a very, very limit, limited scope. We are just focusing on predictive exploration model, no math, no confirmation model, no informal inference, no data discovery, no math. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, the model family is quite large. We have the recommender system that it will be when Netflix tell you uh, what to see. We have the reinforcement, I will say that is more like uh, uh, making a computer know if a picture is a cat or not as a cat. And we have the unsupervised. Actually, it's what I run the most because I do a lot of segmentation. So it's unsupervised is more like uh, sorting stuff and putting your profiling your customer. Uh, it's, and we have the supervised, the ones that are maybe more um, taught. And in this special family, we are just going to look at the linear one. It's all. So it's just to have uh, the big family and just the little one that we are going to, to see on, uh, in the book now. And also, even if they talk about it at the beginning of the introduction chapter, we are not talking about to talk about the training, the query, the test set, all the way we have to split the data. Uh, there is a lot of stuff to know about it, but it's not, it's outside of scope. So it's, it was an easy chapter. Now, model basic. Uh, what is very, very interesting is the way that the book is actually use the constant and the slope of a basic linear model as parameter. Usually we know what are the value, but this time they are parameter and uh, I found in a very good way to teach how to fit the model, even if I wasn't sure about the vocabulary, if we have to say tune parameter or fit a model. I don't know if you have any idea what will be the best way because I saw that tune parameter was better than fit a model, but the book used fit a model. 
because it's like when you are done some random forest and when you are, want to, to tune your parameters, stuff like that, it's the way that uh, the book want to us to work on the just of the basic linear regression. Uh, so we are going to do a very simple model and we are using model R package, uh, which is actually very interesting. I didn't know it at all about it and very interesting. And uh, the option and option action equal and our, it's just that anytime we have NA, we just get a warning. So I didn't know before that about the option, uh, option function in R. So now what we want to figure out is we are, want to find A and A1, A underscore, I don't know how to say under, okay. It's all we want to do. So it will be to use them as parameter. So for that, uh, and something I found very interesting because I completely forgot that there is something like we can do. Uh, so we have uh, uh, just some random data for A1, 1 and O2. And we are going to plot. We have this one are the first one we have since the beginning or simulation. And now we are plotting a bunch of uh, uh, line using this, um, this parameter. So what is really interesting and something I forgot when we use ggplot is that it's possible to mix up two data sets. We using this one, we are plotting the point for this one and we are plotting the linear line using this data model, this one, like that. And it's, so I wanted just to show it because I saw that it was interesting and I forgot about it. So maybe you forgot as well. So now, which is, it's perfect. I just have one, one slide left. Uh, so to figure out what we want to do. And it was something about Colin because we are going to use par, uh, to use map. So basically we want to be able to compute the Euclidean distance between prediction and response. So it's very, very classical. And for this one, we can see that this one is just the way to get the response, the, the prediction. And here we get for each point, we want to compute the, all the prediction. And we want also to take the root, root mean square for everyone. So basically we have AB and we want to apply the measure distance, which will going to return a single number. And in this case, sim one is not an argument as it is a constant. So we are going to use pure. We have two arguments and we want to return a double. So it's math to double. It was good that we just saw pure because it was, uh, so it was interesting. So actually I saw that the chapter was boring, but it was very interesting because it helped to remember what we learned previously. I believe that all is clear because it was, okay. Uh, and this is my last, last slide. So we can see all in action. Uh, so, and this time, what is interesting is because it's returning just a double, it's possible to put it in a mutate because it's just one number. Uh, it's some, uh, I always am really confused between in this. I'm always very confused when I write something like that because I didn't know if I have to put math first or mutate first, stuff like that. So I believe that the rule should be to think first about what are we going to get? So what we are, if we are going to get one double, it makes sense, it's one colon, it makes sense to put it in a mutate. And just because I like to do that, I do it um, with uh, as R, because sometimes it's easier for me to understand what I'm doing. And it's true that the issue when you do exactly the same with as R, it, it, it doesn't give you something nicely put in a tab table. So for sure, using this way is far away better because you get everything directly in one table you can use. And if you use as R, you're just getting a, a, a column. So, which is not very interesting. But anyway, I just want, uh, sometimes I have to do this one first to be able to do that. So it's all I had and it's, I squeeze it in the <laughs> minute I have. 
but uh, it was not anything new. I think it's great. Uh, I haven't even gotten close to doing models or linear models or anything like that. I'm still trying to make sure I understand some of the other basics. So it's nice to see that it's not so hard. It's not out of reach to be able to do this, these kinds of things. It wasn't. We, we. It was just. It wasn't really linear model. We are going to do that next week because there is other function. But it was just what I, I found it very interesting. Is the way that we are using parameter. Yeah. Because it's a must. Yes. So I found it very interesting. And next week it will be about expand grid stuff like that. So it's it's very interesting for tuning a parameter, which is very the higher level. And I found that I saw I I. I volunteer for this chapter, but I wasn't sure because I found it at the beginning. I saw it was boring, but actually it's more interesting than I saw. Yeah. Okay. Great. So are you going to pick it up for us next week as well? Uh, yeah, I will finish up. Uh, uh, I will finish up 22 and do 23 because it's all very connected. Okay, great. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, our, our time is up. Uh, we're at, we're at two minutes after the hour right now. So, um, so I, we I just turned to three minutes after. So we're, time is just marching on. Um, so we, we can cut it off here. Um, and then I think I'm, I, I think I, I'd still like to maybe continue the discussion we were having with the, with Per. Maybe we'll do like an extra session during the week or something. I can set an up, set up an impromptu one if people wanted to join and continue that on. But, um, I don't have anything else to add on today and uh, looking forward to what Sandra has next week for the models. Anybody else have anything? Uh, I can, I can stay after if, if, if you want to go over some of your questions or okay. it's up to you. I, I know people have things after here, but I don't have anything after if you want to stay, but okay. I don't want to force anybody else to stay. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, I, I probably should go, um, I have to take my kids over somewhere, but, um, it, maybe I'll just set up something in the Slack and we can, we can just get together another night before next Wednesday and go through it. Whoever wants to can come through. You can see my stream of consciousness comments, um, where I, my happy faces and sad faces as errors show up, but, um, that's all I've got. So thanks, Colin, for going over what you had today. Thanks, Sandra, for yours and, and everybody for your participation and your comments. And um, we'll we'll talk again next week, if not before. Okay. Cool. Bye-bye. Sure. All Bye -bye. right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>